right, we are continuing in our series on prophecy and prophets, and for the last several weeks we've been talking about the return of Messiah, Messiah Yeshua. We've been looking at what the scripture has to say about his return, the timing of his return. And the reason why, the reason why we're doing this is because I think we all feel that we are very close to all of these events unfolding before our eyes. And it's very important that you know the timing of how all of these things occur. And let me just say, for those of you who have not been here for the other parts, um, and I don't know whether you take notes or not, but we have already looked at several passages um, in talking about uh, the, the return of the Mashiach. Once we're done with these passages that we're going to be looking at, which I, I think we'll probably get done today, this part, we will then take a look at the anti-Messiah, the Antichrist, and what the Scripture has to say about him. We're looking at the, the true Messiah first because just as a banker would learn how to identify a real piece of money so that they can know what a counterfeit looks like in comparison, so we are looking at the real first and becoming familiar with the real so that when the false comes, we will be able to know the false. Okay? And that's why this is so important. The church has historically taught a particular, uh, predominantly, not, not everybody, but the, the predominant um, belief in regards to the timing of how all of this works is something different than what that Bible actually says. Okay? And so we're, we're actually looking at what does the Bible say, not what do, do denominational traditions say about Yeshua's coming. Okay? And, I, and I would just uh, repeat for the sake of those who have not been here before, the concept or the, the doctrine or teaching that Yeshua will come twice. Uh, the first time he will come like in a secret coming where he just comes down in the sky and he takes all the righteous out of the earth and then he actually comes back in physical form touching down on the earth later. That is not found in the scripture. That concept is only approximate, but somewhere between 150 and 175 years old. It was developed uh, by a lady named Mary MacDonald who had, or no, not Mary, Margaret MacDonald, who had a quote-unquote vision, okay? And then her pastor, and I can't remember what her pastor's name was, but if I, if I said it, you all would recognize the name. What's that? Darby, yes. John Darby took this thing that she said and ran with it, began teaching it. And then Schofield liked the idea and he picked it up and he started putting it all throughout the Bibles that he was printing. And it became extremely pervasive throughout the West. Okay, now if you, if you go to countries such as in Asia, or in Africa, in places where, 
where persecution is basically a way of life for many of them, you will not find this belief. Okay. Um, this is a, it's an escapist mentality that says that everybody that's good or right or whatever isn't going to have to go through anything bad. Okay. There's, again, there's no scriptural evidence of that. And that's what we've been looking at. In every place so far, the passages that we've looked at are Luke chapter 12, verses 30, 35 through 40. Luke chapter 17, verses 26 through 36. Luke 21, 34 through 36. And Matthew chapters 24 and 25. These are all Yeshua himself speaking about how things will happen. And he gives the timing of how things will happen. Okay? But Rav Shaul also talks about it in his writings. And, um, and so that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to start with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 through 11. And I don't know if I said it, but for the sake of the video, uh, this is Prophecy and Prophets part 5. This is part 6. Are we sure? Part 6. Okay, sorry. Sorry people watching on the video, part 6. All right. And the date today is October 25th, 2014. And the... What? <laughs> Thir 31 Tishri 5775. Does somebody have a uh, communique? It has the wrong date. <laughs> Does anyone have a calendar? Okay. Oh, my wife got the calendar. What does the calendar say? Okay. So, so this is one Cheshvan 5775, according to the calendar. Okay. Now that we got that out of the way, Let's go to the text. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 11. Now, before we begin reading through this, over the course of the last few times that we've talked about this issue, one of the things that we saw repeatedly in these passages is that Yeshua would make a statement to the effect that it will be that his coming will be like a thief coming in the night. Okay? That particular phrase does not mean he's not being literal, okay? Why does he use this? this phrase coming like a thief in the night. Yeah, it's, it's associated, remember what he said, no one knows the day or the hour, not even the Son, only the Father knows. Okay? So, 
In other words, what he's saying is, you're a thief coming in the night. You have no idea that the thief is on its way. When he breaks in, you're, you're not expecting the thief to come. Okay? And so, when Yeshua says this, he's saying, nobody's going to know for sure exactly when this is going to happen. Okay? But you remember, I, I, we also talked about the fact that God has given us clues in the Scripture that let us know the general time frame. Okay? We may not be able to be specific, but we can know the time frame because of certain things, events, and so on that must occur in a certain order before His coming. Last Shabbat, we talked about the very fact that in His own words, Yeshua said to Yerushalayim, as He was looking out over Yerushalayim, you will not see me again until you say Baruch Haba Bashem Adonai Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and we ask the question are the people of Israel saying in regards today in regards to Yeshua Baruch Haba Bashem Adonai absolutely not they are not ready for him they, don't, they would not welcome Him. So, is Yeshua coming tomorrow? No, He's not. According to His own words, the people of Israel first have to come to a place where they say, we welcome you before He'll come. Okay? Now, I have no idea what all is going to have to transpire to get them to that point where they actually say that but according to his own words. Are his words sure? Yeah. Yes. According to his own words. Yeshua is not coming back tomorrow. What's the, the address? Can somebody look that up for me? Okay. Because I don't know that off the top of my head. Okay, so anyway... He had said, my coming is going to be like a thief in the night. Now let's take a look at what Rav Shaul writes. He says, but you, brothers, are not in the dark, so that the day should take you by surprise like a thief. So, so if Rav Shaul is saying this, who was Yeshua talking to? If he said, my coming would be like a thief thief in the night. Yes. Matthew 23, 39. Okay. Baruch haba b'shem Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, so who was Yeshua talking about or talking to when he made the statement that his coming would be like a thief in the night? What's that? Yeah. Anybody, anybody who doesn't have a relationship with God through the Messiah, Yeshua, it's going to, like, like Yeshua said in these passages that we just looked at, in, in Matthew chapter 24, He said, at the coming of the Son of Man, it will be like the days of Noah, where people will be going about their normal lives, doing their normal things, and then suddenly it's going to happen and then it's going to be totally unexpected. Just like with the, the flood. And it, isn't it apropos that we're talking about this at this moment in time where the Torah portion is Noah? But Rav Shaul says, Brothers, you are not in the dark so that the day should take you by surprise like a thief. For you are all people who belong to the light, who belong to the day. We don't belong to the night or to darkness. What happens when it gets dark? 
What happens to us when it gets dark? We can't see. If you go out in the dark without a light source, you will not be able to see what is around you and what's going on. Okay? So Rav Shaul is saying, we don't exist in the dark. We exist in the light. We see what's going on. We see what's happening. So let's not be asleep like the rest are. Again, what is, the, what is the situation when we're asleep? It's just like being in the dark. We're unaware of what's going on around us. Okay? On the contrary, let us stay alert and sober. People who sleep, sleep at night. And people who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us stay sober, putting on trust and love as a breastplate and the hope of being delivered as a helmet. Now, that if you have a complete Jewish Bible, you'll see that at the end of that statement, there is the letter A, and down at the bottom you have Isaiah 59, 17. It's a reference to a passage in Isaiah. We're not going to go there. But it talks about, he's basically quoting from, from this section. That's why that, the words in that statement are uh, bolded. Okay? Now what is this, what does it mean to put on trust and love as a breastplate in the hope of being delivered as a helmet? If... You know, we just talked about the faithfulness of Noah. If we live in a place of obedience, relationship, intimate relationship with God, obedience and faithfulness to God, then it guards our heart from not only from being deceived, but it also guards our heart as far as losing, but becoming despairing, okay? That things are going to get so horrible and that there's not going to be any kind of relief, okay? And the hope of being delivered as a helmet, when we know... When we know, and I'm not talking about knowing up here, when we know that God is faithful and that He is going to deliver us from what is about to occur, that guards our minds from the thoughts. Again, both of these things are basically saying the same thing. It guards us from getting to a point where we think and say, God's never going to do anything to change this situation. Okay? And as we looked in these prior passages in, in prior weeks, we read, according to Yeshua's own words, that what is coming is going to be worse than anything that has ever happened before and nothing after it will be as bad as that. Okay? And I cannot imagine, with all the horrible things that have already happened in, our, in the history of mankind, I cannot imagine anything being worse. But Yeshua says it's going to be worse. And so it is going to be such a trying time for the people on the earth that there will be many that give up hope. There will be many that turn from their faith and their faithfulness. There will be many who will renounce the Messiah in order to preserve their life. And again, in one of these passages that we read, 
Actually, no, it was in Daniel. It tells us that blessed is the person who perseveres and gives the number of days that perseveres through the entire time that the anti-Messiah is doing his thing in the earth. Okay? All right, let's, let's read on. For God has not intended that we should experience His fury, but that we should gain deliverance through our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, who died on our behalf so that whether we are alive or dead, we may live along with Him. Therefore, encourage each other and build each other up just as you are doing. Now, this passage, this verse, for God has not intended that we should experience His fury, but that we should gain deliverance through our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, is one of the proof texts that the folks like to use that believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? What they, what they say is what this means is that since we are not intended or destined to experience God's fury, then that means He will have taken us out of the earth so that we don't experience it. And we've already talked about this in the past. We've talked about the model that God has used throughout the Scripture. And that is the, the main model that God basically instituted, I guess would be the best word to use, as a picture of redemption is the exodus of the people of Israel from Egypt. Okay? That's both our spiritual redemption, but also the physical redemption at the end. Okay? And in that scenario, the people of Israel had to remain in the land until all the plagues we're done. But the thing is that in the midst of all of the suffering and so on that Egypt was experiencing, God was protecting His people in the midst of all of that. Okay? So they were not enduring the fury of God that was being poured out on Egypt. Okay? So just because this says that we're not intended to experience His fury and that we will gain deliverance through our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, that does not mean that we will not be here. Okay? And I, I want to recall to your mind something that I've said in the past. As Rav Shaul is writing these things, It's apparent from him and from the other writers of the Brit HaKadoshah, the New Covenant Scriptures, that they genuinely believed that they were living in the last days and that these things that they were writing about and talking about were going to happen in their lifetime. Okay? And so the imperative that is present in what they're saying, what they're writing, it's placed there because they believe that the people that they're talking to are going to have to endure these things. Okay? And so, the question arises, if, if we're not going to be around when the anti-Messiah is here, and the time of, quote unquote, the time of tribulation is occurring, then what would be the point of verse 11? Why would you need to encourage each other and build each other up? Okay? With these words. Okay? If you're going to be gone and you're not going to experience anything bad, there's no reason to encourage one another. Okay? We're all going to be gone. So, this yet again is another passage that lends itself to help us to understand that we're going to be here to endure some pretty hard stuff. But 
if all of the passages that we have read so far are not enough, then we're going to flip over a page to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And Rav Shaul, in this passage, says it in no uncertain terms. And the whole purpose that he's writing this is, he says, I don't want you to be deceived. Okay? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. But in connection with the coming of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah and our gathering together to meet Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be easily shaken in your thinking or anxious because of a spirit or a spoken message or a letter supposedly from us claiming that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. Here's, here's the statement. For the day will not come. What is the day? The day that Yeshua comes back. Okay? Remember we talked about it's going to be one event. Just like it was with Noah. When, the, when God shut Noah into the ark and the rain started coming, the rain destroyed the wicked and saved Noah and his family. It was one event. Okay? So, for the day will not come until after the apostasy has come and the man who separates himself from Torah has been revealed. Who is the man who separates himself from Torah? The anti-Messiah. Okay? Until the, one who, the man who separates himself from Torah has been revealed, the one destined for doom. He will oppose himself to everything that people call a god or make an object of worship. He will put himself above them all so that he will sit in the temple of God and proclaim that he himself is God. Okay? Don't you remember that when I was still with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is restraining, so that he may be revealed in his own time. For already this separating from Torah is at work secretly, but it will be secretly only until he who is restraining is out of the way. Now, does somebody have a King James Version Bible? Okay. May I use it? Does it turn to that passage? Well, Mark looks like Mark has it. Thank you. Verse 5, I want to read in the King James Version. The wording of the King James Version, obviously if you have read it or if you use it, you'll know that it is um, Old English. Okay? So the wording, sometimes the wording can be confusing to us. Because we don't speak Old English. Okay? It says, Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, uh, uh, verse 5, that you may be counted... Whoops, I'm looking, I'm looking at the wrong place here. Oh, okay, chapter 2, verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Okay? The reason why I wanted to read it out of that version is because that is a favorite, again, that is another favorite quote by the people who 
who support the pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? And basically what they will tell you is that what this means is that the Holy Spirit is the one who is restraining all of these things from happening. Okay? And that when the when when Yeshua comes in the sky and raptures all of the believers, raptures the church, quote unquote, then the Holy Spirit goes with the church up into heaven and the Holy Spirit is no longer down here on the earth. And because the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, then evil can just run rampant in the earth. And that's their explanation for this particular passage. Okay? Well, obviously it is, it is the Holy Spirit that is restraining uh, Hasatan from being able to do just anything and everything that he wants to do. Because there is a timing on the part of God for how all of these things are supposed to happen. Okay? If the Holy Spirit was to back off and say, okay, Hasatan, you can do whatever you want to, then Hasatan would try to force something to happen prematurely before God's time, okay? And God's not going to allow that to happen. So there are certain things that have to take place first. Now, we've already established from previous passages that we looked at that, that the anti-Messiah will enter into a seven year or will begin a seven year some kind of covenant or agreement with the people of Israel and at the halfway point he will cause the daily sacrifices that have been going on in the temple it will cause them to cease okay it then tells us that he will proclaim himself to be God, that he will set himself up uh, a throne in the temple and, and rule from the temple as God, and that he will erect a statue uh, also in the temple. Okay? And so, according to According to what we have just read here in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, we find out that Yeshua's return cannot and will not happen until after the anti-Messiah is revealed and after He has set Himself up as God in the temple. Okay? We don't have a temple. There are no sacrifices going on, therefore. And so, again, Yeshua cannot return tomorrow because these things which were prophesied in the Scripture have not occurred. Okay? Now we read, we read on... <clears throat> And this is going to be our segue into next Shabbat's first message on the anti-Messiah. Okay? We had stopped with the end of verse 7. Verse 8 says, Then the one who embodies separation from Togah will be revealed the one whom the Lord Yeshua will slay with the breath of His mouth and destroy by the glory of His coming. So that tells us right there, when He comes, guess who's dying? Anti-Messiah, He's out of there. Okay? And there are other passages that, that speak about the Messiah opening His mouth and a, sh and a sword coming out of His mouth 
to slay his enemies. When this man who avoids Togah comes, the adversary will give him the power to work all kinds of false miracles, signs, and wonders. And we began at the very beginning of this series. We started off, the reason why it's called Prophecy and Prophets is because we wanted to establish from a scriptural basis what it means to be a prophet. Okay? Not to, not to have the gift of prophecy, but to ha hold the office of a prophet. There is a difference. The gift of prophecy is given to individuals in order to encourage and support the body. Okay? To benefit the body. But a person who is called to the actual office of a prophet has a job that they have to do where they address large groups of people giving them messages from God. And a person who is in the, in the office of a prophet never has to announce that they are a prophet. It is obvious by the anointing of the Holy Spirit being on them that they are a prophet. Everybody will just know it. Okay? They don't have to go around saying, I'm prophet so-and-so, okay? Which is, is an occurrence, a very wide occurrence within the church world, okay? And, and I don't believe God is, is good with that at all. Um, so the whole point of this in the beginning was to establish what is a true prophet? And what is true prophecy? Okay? And then we went from there into the coming of the Mashiach. Because what is the point of a prophet? Okay? The point of the prophet, what, it, what is his role? His role is to call people back to God because they are in a state of sinfulness and God is going to intervene in some way. Okay? The intervening that we are now talking about is Yeshua in bodily form intervening in the earth. Okay? And the, but we're going to be talking about in the next few weeks, I know we did it out of order. But we, like I said in the beginning, we did it because we want to know the real first before we talk about the fake. But we did it out of, out of the, the chronological order of things in that the anti-Messiah is going to show up first and then when the, Messiah, when the true Messiah shows up, he's going to take care of the anti-Messiah. Okay? So we wanted to establish the truth about prophecy, prophets and the timing of Yeshua and the anti-Messiah. That will be the ultimate dealing with sin. So we read that he will, oh, the, my point, the point that I was getting to is during the discussion about prophets and uh, prophecy and prophets, we talked about the fact that there were many prophets, the ancient prophets of Israel, in fact the majority of them, never performed any kind of sign or wonder. Okay? We end up thinking about the ones who did the most, like Elijah, okay? who did perform signs and wonders. But most of the prophets of Israel never performed a sign or a wonder. And so that is not a qualification for being a prophet of God, okay, necessarily. And yet, this man will use these kinds of things to try to prove to the world that he is who he says he is, okay? Well, we, we're finding out from the Scripture, by going through the Scripture here, that God is not the only one that can perform miracles, signs, and wonders. Okay? 
So we talked about the, ne the necessity of having spiritual discernment. And that when you, even today, when you see a sign or a wonder, a miracle, you need to be asking the Lord for discernment as to whether or not it is a true miracle or it's a false miracle. Okay? Because th there are false miracle signs and wonders going on today. Okay? And in fact, what we did talk about was that God in the Torah said, if a person comes to you doing signs and wonders, if they predicted something and it actually comes true, but their message is to go after other gods rather than the one true God, then you know that that prophet is false. So it's not just the criteria either of them proclaiming a prophecy and it coming true. It's a combination, okay? The two have to go together. Number one, does what they say come true coupled with what is the message behind what they're saying? If it doesn't jive with the Word of God, with what God wants, if it's leading people astray from God and what God wants, it's a false message. Okay? So, anyway, this guy's going to come. He's going to be doing all these things. And most of the people in the world will be fooled because they have no discernment and they don't know the Scripture. Okay? They'll look at all these amazing things that he does and they'll go, oh my goodness, he must be God. Okay? Because of what he can do. He will enable him. Who's the he? God. God will enable the anti-Messiah to deceive in all kinds of wicked ways those who are headed for destruction because they would not receive the love of the truth that could have saved them. Folks, if we are living in a state where we are so dead set on our religious traditions that we cannot hear the truth of the Word of God. We are in grave danger. Danger of being deceived. And it says that the people who would not stomach the truth that could have saved them, they're headed for destruction. This is why God is causing them to go astray so that they will believe the lie. The result will be that all who have not believed the truth but have taken their pleasure in wickedness will be condemned. This is why he begins this section by telling us or, excuse me, why he wrote in the section before, in chapter 5, he warned the Thessalonians, you guys need to be alert and sober. You need to be watching. Okay? Because if, if we allow ourselves if we're not diligent, if we're not vigilant, if we're not studying the Word of God to know what it says, then we will be deceived. And it says that the peop those people who reject the truth will not believe the truth now, here's, here's the thing. And I want to be very careful because I can't make a blanket, a blanket statement and I don't want my, what I have to say to seem like a condemnation or a judgment 
my own judgment on anyone because God is the one who's going to have to judge and make the decisions about those that are condemned and those that are saved. But verse 12 says the result will be that all who have not believed the truth but have taken their pleasure in wickedness will be condemned. Does that include people in the church? Yes. Yes. And I would dare say that there's a whole lot of people right now here in the United States especially <clears throat> that think that they're good, think they're okay. But they have rejected the truth. And God equates the rejection of truth with wickedness. Do you know what, do you know what the term wicked means? Because we end up, when when person says, oh, that person's wicked, we end up thinking of, in terms of all of the bad things that they do. Okay? And so when, we, when somebody says wickedness, we're thinking just uh, of sin. Okay? Which, obviously, wickedness is sin. But there's a very specific aspect to wickedness. The word wickedness comes from the same root word that we get the word wick like a wick in a candle have you ever looked at the wick of a candle it's a bunch of cotton fibers that are what twisted okay a wicked person is a twisted person and how how do we become twisted if if we do not believe the truth, if we do not align ourselves with the truth, the truth is straight. Okay? The scripture is full of that particular metaphor talking about the straightness of truth and righteousness. Okay? So if we reject the truth, then what is the only alternative? If we're going to say there is no gray area, there's only black and white when it comes to the kingdom of dark light and kingdom of darkness, as soon as you reject the truth, you become twisted. You're wicked. Okay. So, again, the thing that I emphasized at the end of the message last Shabbat, I want to emphasize again. We all have friends. We all have relatives. We all have co-workers or schoolmates or whatever whom we know have rejected the truth. And they may even be churchgoers. But they've rejected the truth. It's not enough for us to look at the Scripture and acknowledge, well, they're condemned. The Scripture says that God's heart is that no one should perish. And so we need to be praying. Praying for our friends, our relatives that have rejected the truth, that they will receive the truth. That they will no longer be wicked. That they will no longer be condemned. And when we get the opportunity, and I'm not talking about shoving things down people's throats, but when we get the opportunity to live the truth and speak the truth to those people, we need to take it. Because their very eternal existence depends on it.
Next Shabbat, we will continue and we will take, begin taking a look at the passages that specifically speak about the anti-Messiah and what he will do and the timing of what he will do and so on. For today, let's, let's close with prayer. Yet again, Father, I pray as I did at the beginning. That you will continue to work on us. To change us. To align us with the truth of your word. Father, this congregation has been challenging the religious sacred cows for well, since the beginning. But Father, uh, over the years, people have come and gone. And when new people come, many times they're coming directly from some former Christian denomination. And Father, we, we pray for all of our brothers and sisters in the Lord, no matter what denomination they, they are a part of. Father, we ask that you will lead your people, your bride, into the truth. That you will cause us to be aligned with you and with your words. Father, that there would be no wickedness amongst us, no twistedness, but that you would make us straight. Abba, as we begin to take a look at the description of the anti-Messiah and what he will do. Father, I pray that you will yet again help us to sort all of this information out and put it in the right order so that we have a clear understanding of what will happen and how it will happen and when it will happen. So when the time comes for all of this to occur, we'll know exactly what is supposed to happen and we will not be deceived by what other people's people say or by false miracles, signs, or wonders. But that we will know with all assurance what your word says. In Yeshua's name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, 
our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.